Hi, I'm Laura Flanders, a bank reformer with a band. Fancy that. Today on The Laura Flanders Show, Gwen Hallsmith talks about race, gender, and bias in banking. Could we ever be free of it? We can start to close the gap between the 1% and the rest of us. And later in the show... The areas where you're poor and the areas where there's majority, minority, those areas tend to have the greatest crisis waiting to explode. All that and a few words from me on dark money and shedding light. We can do it. Welcome to the program. Gwendolyn Hallsmith is the founder and executive director of Global Community Initiatives and has over 25 years of experience working with municipal, regional, and state governments in the U.S. and internationally. She's also the author of several books, including her most recent, Vermont Dollars, Vermont Cents, published this year with Michael Schumann and the Post Carbon Institute. The book describes how people, organizations, financial advisors, and governments can move money currently invested in Wall Street to benefit Main Street businesses. She even has a band called the New Economistas. Welcome, Gwen. I'm so glad to have you back on the program. Well, thanks. It's great to be here. There have been so many developments since last we spoke, um, but let's start at the top. Vermont dollars. What do you mean? Well, we're looking at how you move your money from Wall Street investments, which is where most people have their retirement savings and their IRAs and other things, into the local economy. Because right now there aren't that many options. And people have become more and more interested in local economies. They buy local food, you know, but where their money grows and helps them out over time is still somewhere far away. Now, why why is that? I mean, because as you said, there's been a big push towards localism, invest locally, buy locally. Why is it so hard? What are the obstacles? Well, there's several obstacles, some of which Michael Schumann wrote about in his book, Local Dollars, Local Cents. A lot of the obstacles have to do with the rules of the game. So it's very difficult as a small investor to invest in a local business because of all the SEC rules that require all sorts of filings and due diligence on how you are able to offer a security into SEC, the market. SEC, the Securities, Securities and Exchange, and Exchange Commission. Commission. Exactly. Michael likes to say how your grandmother can actually get on a bus, go to Las Vegas, and blow the family fortune without so much as a warning okay. on the thing. But meanwhile, if she wants to allow the local grocery store starting up to have 200 of her dollars, that local grocery store has had to spend $40,000 on a bunch of paperwork that basically says, you might lose your money, you might lose your money, right. <laughs> you might lose your money. We had him on the show, and I think he talked about sort of investment apartheid. So how can we advance this localist investing movement if those are the obstacles? Well, one of the recent developments that's helped a lot is the Jobs Act, which passed several years ago and was supposed to revise some of the Security and Exchange Commission rules to allow for more local investment by small investors. And that's what prompted me to write the book. Because actually, each state is different when it comes to the rules around investing. And Vermont has long had fairly liberal rules on the books that already allow people in small investments when it's just in Vermont businesses to invest in a local business. So that's how Ben & Jerry's got started, for example. And we talk about that a little in the book, was they opened up their investments to Vermonters to invest in their startup. And those folks are very happy now that they <laughs> invested in Ben & Jerry's okay. way back then because it did really well. And <clears throat> so we thought we would start with Vermont to show how these new SEC rules work in practice because in Vermont, for Vermonters and Vermont businesses, those rules have already been mm. in place for a long time. But is this only good then for Vermont? No, actually, there's a number of states now that are catching up to the SEC rules and writing their own rules. Michigan is one. I think Colorado has some legislation on the books. And so our hope with the book is to move from beyond Vermont dollars, Vermont cents, into other states as well so that every state would have its own handbook of how you can invest in your own local businesses in your state without running afoul of the Security and Exchange Commission. Now, the last <laughs> time that we talked to you, it was about your drive to start a state bank in Vermont, um, along the kind of North Dakota model. Uh, remind people what happened with that, and how did that campaign kind of connect with this work? Yeah, it's all about how you invest local money. And of course, in the state bank campaign, we asked 
town meetings to endorse the idea of a state bank, which they did. Yep. Twenty towns voted to direct their legislators to set up a state bank. So first you need a town meeting structure for your local government. <laughs> well, Vermont has one not that many places. It was actually a political strategy. You can do a similar project asking for a state bank just working with the legislature. We had been doing that for several years and we found that the lobbyists for the banking industry were actually quite powerful in the yeah. legislature and so that's why we brought it to the people instead. I'm all for it. And now we have legislation that's being pursued in New Hampshire without the town meeting vote. Mm -hmm. But there's a big conference and they've moved some legislation forward. They're likely to establish a commission as we go into the next legislative session to study the banking system there and put together a business plan for a state bank. But in Vermont, we got not quite all the way to a state bank. We got what was called the 10% for Vermont program established. And this was a program that directs the state treasurer to take 10% of her average daily deposits. And rather than putting them on deposit in the big banks like Bank of America and TD Bank, which is where she currently puts them, to loan them out through our state lending institutions. Now in Vermont, we have the Vermont Economic Development Authority, the Vermont Municipal Bond Bank, the Vermont Housing Finance Agency, the Vermont Student Assistance Corporation, and the State Infrastructure Bank. So we have a number of different state level lending institutions that now that money mm like it was on deposit, kind of goes out and is lent into the Vermont economy with our state tax dollars. So that's been around for a year. What's come of it so far? Well, a couple years. It actually was reauthorized last year. And in the first year of operation, $10 million went through the Vermont Economic Development Authority for solar projects that couldn't have been financed any other way. So we've already seen a huge impact of this local dollar lending through our state investment agencies um, in the renewable energy sector. There was also a number of energy efficiency projects that were financed that way through the Vermont um, Housing Authority mm -hmm. and also some other student loans are being looked at now, a ways to, for parents to refinance their student loans when their students have either stayed in mm. Vermont or where the parents in Vermont have sent their mm. students out I of mean, state. it's not as if we don't lend money to companies from private dollars in the normal way of doing things. We've been giving tax breaks to corporations for years. Your focus on the local changes what about what kinds of people are benefiting, what kinds of businesses, but what kinds of people? Well, there's a number of examples in the book that talk about people using these innovative financing strategies, either the kind of low, low lending, what are they, small loan mm -hmm. business like through Kiva, or through even intergenerational lending within families. And what happens with those innovative strategies is the people who are starting businesses get lower cost financing to get their businesses started with better terms so that if they have, let's say, a long time before they have profits, <laughs> which is typically the case for small businesses, mm -hmm. you're usually in business for three years before you show right. profits, the financing isn't going to take over and send you to the poorhouse, essentially. So, so does that affect the race and gender of some of these business owners? I guess one of my questions is how racialized and gendered are our state economies and, and our state lending practices? Um, and can you imagine a banking system that is anti-racist and feminist, perhaps? Oh, absolutely. Wow. In fact, the banking system and the monetary structure itself, if you look at its, where it sits along the spectrum of, let's say, yin and yang, it's way on the yang end because the way our money system is structured promotes competition mm -hmm. and cutthroat competition in most cases, whereas other types of monetary systems like time banks and commercial barter systems and things that don't rely on the national dollars that we rely on or have our, our whole economy on are actually much more cooperative in form and do foster some of the things that we typically associate with both women and people who are not in the competitive mainstream. Or who have to pool resources to get anywhere, even get a, a foot in the door. Exactly, exactly. So in Vermont, we have started a big time bank called the Onion River Exchange, which allows people to trade with time instead of money. How does that work? So if I need a ride to the airport, I put a request into the system that I need a ride to the airport. And somebody will give me a ride to the airport. And instead of me paying them $50, which is what it would normally cost me to go there, 
I'll pay them in time. It'll take them three hours back and forth. And I would have maybe spent three hours helping somebody else go to a doctor's appointment mm -hmm. or something else. And that time trade is what drives the system instead of money. So I don't actually have to provide that person with something. Got it. They get their hours for me, and then they can go spend it whatever they want. So is what's been the pushback? I mean, I, I'm sure a lot of people view it, look at this and say, well, that's just Vermont. I could never do that where I am. Um, Vermont's special. special. <laughs> we are, and you know, we've got. We like that. <laughs> we've got a special guy running for president too. Well, I want to ask right you now, about right, Bernie Sanders right, too. Bernie Sanders, but um, time banks are all over the world now, so there's nothing Vermonty necessarily about time banks. Um, and the way in which we've helped direct some of the local dollars that we have into local investment is also very accessible for people all over the country. Local Dollars, Local Sense is the go-to book if you're not from Vermont, but if you are interested in writing or helping write a book like that for your state, you know, get in touch with Michael and the Post Carbon Institute or me and we'll help you do it. Because I think if we could see that shift from all these dollars that are now going into Wall Street and flowing into the big corporations through the stock market to the dollars flowing into local businesses, we would see a revival of local economies, yeah. which is badly needed across the country. I don't know how much you follow those statistics, but there's a lot of unemployment still. There's a lot of underemployment. And the more dollars we can redirect into our local economies, the healthier mm. our local economy. You mentioned the future. Will we have a President Sanders in the future? Oh, I think? hope so. He's <laughs> a great guy. I'm really hoping he And is he on board with well. all of us? Oh, of course. Yeah, he's fighting against the big banks. You've seen that in the press. And he's been a real supporter of the work I've done in Vermont for many years. You're supporting Sanders. He's on board with all this. So will you be playing at his inauguration with your band, oh, the that would New be, Economistas? That would be wonderful. Who are the, the band? It's just me and my husband, and we rewrite some old public domain melodies into topical songs about banking and money. Like. That's also available <laughs> on SoundCloud for free, so you can download the songs for free. Well, one of our main songs is Making Money Out of Air. That's the name of the CD. But there's another one we re rewrote called Diddy Wa Diddy, which is originally a song about sex. Diddy Wa Diddy was code for sex, and it was written back in the 20s. But we called the new song Economic Words. Mm. And so it's all about the words that are so mm. confusing when you're reading the paper, you know, quantitative easing and stimulus package. And It all sounds very sexual now that you put it that way. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Let me ask you, though, on that one last question I had meant to ask you, which was, who do you have working on this work? Because to some people, banking sounds so dry and also requires special, special specif you know, um, specialized knowledge. Uh, how do you make banking sexy? Well, Beyond the songs, maybe. The songs actually <laughs> help a lot because I think they demystify it some. But you'd be surprised how many people are genuinely interested in it. So a lot of the people that we've had working in Vermont are just everyday citizens that want to see a better economy for Vermont and want to improve on the huge problem we have with income inequality. Because, of course, the problems with income inequality go right back right. to the banking and monetary systems. And if we can change those, even in very small ways, we can start to close the gap between the 1% and the rest of us, which is really a good goal. If you want to play a role in closing that gap and get your hands on Gwen's book, you can. It is available via a free download. And we'll put a link at our website. Gwendolyn, thank you so much for coming on the program. Yeah, thank you. The days have turned to months since the water crisis in Flint, Michigan first came to light. The lead poisoning in the water, the result of a shift in the water supply ordered by an emergency manager to cut costs, is being connected to everything from a rise in lead levels in children's blood to Legionnaire's disease. Brenda Lawrence represents the 14th district in Michigan. This is her home turf. I asked her what that water crisis looks like. Talk directly to us, Congressman, about what is happening in Flint right now. What are people dealing with up close? Right now, there is this lack of trust in our government. Um, there's water being distributed. Uh, there are central locations where people are picking up water. So think about water to drink, water to cook with, water to bathe with. Um, 
it is a situation that has so many ripple effects. Just think about our government. There's three basic things every human being that is a citizen of these United States expect from their government. That's air, that's clean to breathe, food that's safe to eat, and water that they can consume that will not harm them. We fail in a basic trust of our government. We don't think about it in America when we turn on our water. So what did we learn from this situation? We learned that there was a breakdown in our government. There, for some reason, there was this sense of, for economic reasons, not to comply with the Clean Water Act, not to ensure that the safety of American citizens, 10, it was 100,000 people, 7,000 children. The children is a critical issue because lead that was in the water because of lack of treatment it attacks the brain of a developing child and it's irreversible. You cannot go back and clean it up. When did you first become aware of the problem? I became aware of the problem living in Michigan when Dan Kildee started talking about this water issue. So I drove up, he's an hour away from me, and we sat down with the EPA the Environmental Protection, and we also sat down with the Michigan Environmental Quality Department and said, what is happening here? Because they were under an emergency manager. An emergency manager is the state government taking all home rule away from a local city. So the state made this decision. And then from that, we, my heart went out to, to this community I mean, I'm, I'm a member of Congress. I was previously a mayor. Our ultimate responsibility is to take care of the people of this country. And so I call, I sit on the oversight committee and I call for a hearing asking for all those people who were the decision makers to come and tell us what happened, when it happened, and why did you not treat the water? As a mayor, I used to say this all the time. People say, what keeps you awake at night? I said, it is you flush your toilet and you go to bed. I am concerned about the infrastructure under the ground. If we cannot provide clean water to our communities, to our country, we cannot live. And this water main breaks, bridges falling, all of these things until it, we don't see it and everything seems normal. But those of us who know we have an infrastructure crisis and the poor, and those, the areas where you're poor and the areas where there's majority, minority, those areas tend to have the greatest crisis waiting to explode. So talk about why the pressure on, car, on, on electives has permitted this to continue. Because you look at the, outs, from the outside, you look at our electoral system and you say, well, local people elect local officials. They should be accountable for local needs. Mm -hmm. Why hasn't that worked? And instead, why have we had this res the result of kicking these infrastructure needs down the, down the road. Let's look at the financing of cities in America. The poorer the community, the less resources they have. The poorer the community, the less voice they have. They do not have the power of the big voices, the infrastructure people that would, the residents, that would say this is unacceptable. We know poor people are not heard. So then they are usually in the older parts of the community. So that elevates the challenges of their infrastructure. So if, no, if I have a choice and the infrastructure is failing, I have money and resources, I move. Mm. But if I don't have resources, I'm there. This is my home. This is where I live because I don't have the money to move. So the people who are in power choose other locations. So here we are with this epidemic in our country with the per people with the less amount of influence and resources. So how do we need to restructure not just our priorities, but our democracy, our, our systems of power? It's incumbent upon me as a member of Congress. That's why I call for this hearing. And I'm gonna continue this.
with the messaging on investment of our infrastructure. If we start with water and saying that we are going to finance the replace, replacing of lead pipes in America, how, how, that's simplistic, but that is so powerful. It's an investment from us to these communities, federal dollars that we're talking about. We find money for um, a multitude of things. Water is basic in America. We must have a collective agenda on fixing the water system in America. Should Governor Rick Snyder be replaced? Rick Snyder is the ultimate responsible person. He said it in his state of the state. He apologized and he said the buck stops with me and he said he was going to fix it. There's going to be a lot of discussion on where he is. I don't think this man deliberately as a governor poisoned the children of Flint. I will never say that. But the reality is 9,000 children have been poisoned by lead in our drinking water. Part of the job for us as elected officials is to know what the challenges are so that we can go do our job and legislate. So I'm, I'm so proud of the Congressional Progressive Caucus and the Black Caucus and, and the leadership are going to Flint to hear the people. And I, again, I'm pushing for this not to be an episode, well, but a call to action. A call to action to change things. What changes could you imagine? I mean, what do we need to change about the way we make decisions, about the way we fund infrastructure, um, about how we you know, keep people accountable? In brief, do you see it? I see the way that we change things is that we really elevate the basic needs of our country. Um, Security of our country is extremely important. Um, the investment in our infrastructure is extremely important. But food, air, and water, that should always be a priority. Because if we don't have those, we die. A priority meaning government should have planning. And, How yes. important is planning? It's, it's, it's the budget. It's investment of resources, making it a priority. When we debate the budget, and we have things like, are we going to plan, uh, fund Planned Parenthood? And we have an infrastructure crisis. We spent millions of dollars on the Benghazi hearing. Millions. That millions of dollars could have gone into our infrastructure. We got to get it right. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dark money, super PACs, shady multimillionaires buying up democracy. When Americans were asked recently what they fear most, it wasn't terrorists, unless you mean the sort that take over your TV at election time, it was corruption. It's that fear that a certain multi-millionaire megalomaniac is playing into when he says, I'm so rich, I can't be bought, so vote for me. But is voting for a billionaire to protect you from rule by billionaires a sensible way to fight money in politics? Not exactly. It just looks that way on television because we see so little else. Is today's election auction normal or inevitable? Neither. A handful of Supreme Court decisions decided by a single vote, five to four, unloosed this particular cash flow. It's happened mostly over the last decade. As the Brennan Center reported this January, just one justice shifting opinion could speedily restore some common sense. Change won't come easily. In the last quarter century, the share of political contributions traceable to the top hundredth of Americans has doubled from 15 percent to 30 percent. Excess corporate cash rushes into every congressional and state house office in the land. Clearly, concentration of wealth is the problem. Corruption is the consequence. But it's just not true that there's nothing regular Americans can do. Reformers in California are gathering signatures right now to put a voter's bill of rights on the ballot next November. That would require TV ads to display their top donors, clearly enough that you can read it, and overhaul the state's campaign finance database to make tracking special interests easier. California's measure could send a message, even to justices. Similar efforts are underway in Maine and Washington 
and South Dakota. But paying more attention to people making change would require media to change. They might have to pay just a little less attention to that billionaire. So tell me what you think. Write to Laura at lauraflanders.com. And thanks. What would our world look like today if our media showed us as much collaboration as they do competition? What if we got to meet people making change right here, right now, in all sorts of ways we're usually told are impossible? Subscribe today to The Laura Flanders Show for in-depth interviews with forward-thinking people. Smarts, not sound bites, every week, right here. Subscribe and thanks. Laura Flanders show poetry and trans politics with the performance group Dark Matter. Trans women and trans feminine people have been doing feminist organizing forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that actually colonization on this land was about trans misogyny. Actually Stonewall was about trans women and trans feminine people of color resisting police violence. Mm -hmm. This week on the program, I talk with one of the most recognized street artists in the world. Her name is Swoon. I think that there's this feeling that what you're going to make is a square that's for investment, that goes over a couch, and that that's the whole of its life cycle. And for me, I was like, no, creativity is everything to me. She's brought her art from the streets to musical houses in New Orleans and a rebuilding community in Haiti. Mm -hmm.